Good day, everyone. Today, I'm talking to Mutambay Karyuki, who's a co-founder of Fastagger. Good day, Mutambay. How are you? Oh, fine, thank you, Tony. I'm in Nairobi. It's sunny outside. It's uh, quite nice warm weather. So a good beginning to the year. Thank you very much for making this possible. You are most welcome. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to the conversation. Um, it's, it's always a great opportunity to, to talk about great ideas with very intelligent and you know driven people. So I always love sharing because I also get to learn quite a lot in the process as well. Are you happy for me to move into our first question? Yes. Mutembe, can you please share a little about yourself, the place you were born, your education, your passion, the things that you enjoy doing, and one thing that the public might not know about you? Yes. Well, I'm born and brought up here in Kenya. I was born a bit on the outskirts of our capital city here in Nairobi. I was born in a relatively peri-urban area. It wasn't, you know, sort of the best of neighborhoods, but uh, my parents did the best to, you know, take care of us and uh, move us out of that particular area. But, you know, that particular early upbringing in that sort of area, like really put the drive in me to really push myself and see more of the world and see how much I can do to actually build things that could contribute to the world. And that has sort of informed the way I've lived my life. Did my early schooling here in Kenya, got a lot of opportunities to travel. I was part of an international student organization called ISEC, which pretty much took me to over 30 countries, five continents, really engaging with a lot of international people because I always had that thirst to really learn from people around the world and you know, really know you know how to innovate, how to how to build things and how to change society. A lot of this was really brought in by my early experiences working with uh, the UN, you know, as a high school student, started engaging with young people who had been child soldiers in places like Sierra Leone and Liberia, you know, who were roommates at some conferences. And, you know, at that time in high school as a teenager, you're only thinking about academics and girls. But, you know, that experience really changed the way I looked at the world, seeing that things were a lot more complex than I thought. I did the driving me to see how can I contribute to the world? How can I use all the gifts and strength that the world has given me to do better? I think that is actually one of the things that a lot of uh, people might not know about me is that I, even though I've had this great opportunities for, for traveling and everything, I, I've always had inside me like a really strong desire to use particularly tech to solve problems in the world. I mean, people won't know that, but my first experience with a computer was actually as one of these computers that are usually sold by companies, not really sold, but dumped by companies every couple of years. My dad got an opportunity to get one of these computers and brought it home and I just would not stop using it. I'd be asked to go eat, to to go out and play with my brothers and sisters and neighbors. But I just, I just was so engrossed, you know, in this old Apple II computer. You know, those ones where the screen, when you switch it on, it still brings like a green line and goes on. And the coding was was just in like languages like Pascal or Basic. And that really is what got me into, you know, wanting to see how I can use technology to impact the world. And then those experiences with the UN really um, also changed my perspective. That's a bit in a nutshell about me. Excellent, Mutembe. Thank you so much for sharing about your early journeys as you slowly ventured into the tech space. And now moving on to our second question. Mutembe, looking at your LinkedIn profile, I can see that you have had working experience in companies or businesses out of various geographic locations, USA, India. Austria, Brazil, Philippines, Japan, and your home country, Kenya. I'm sure there would be other countries as well, which you have not mentioned. You could probably share about them later. With or under designations such as National Vice President Talent Management, Global Coordinator Asia, Social Innovation Manager, to name a few. I'm sure you would have got a lot of new ideas, insights, or learnings with this global exposure. Could you please share three that are on top of your mind? Thanks. That's true. I I count myself very fortunate to have had uh, all these experiences to travel. I think it's a philosopher, Augustine, who says that, you know, the world is like a book and those who have not traveled, people who haven't even read one page of this book. And, you know, those opportunities really opened me up in terms of really seeing what is out there, what is possible, you know, how all human beings are really connected, no matter what culture we come up with, and also how much there is to learn from each other. And only that through working together can we get anywhere. A lot of the things that I really learned was one, you know, how important self-awareness is. Really 
knowing who you are, the foundation of where you're from, and what unique attributes you bring to the world. That's one of the most important things I've learned in all these countries, over all these continents, all these cultures that I've, I've interacted with. A friend of mine once, um, we were in Austria, and I know at that time, it was my first time to live outside my home country for over a year. So I was really stressed out. I was really trying to learn more about the culture and integrate myself in that culture. One time, one of my friends, and she's become a really good friend over the years, she told me something really interesting when I was really you know, stressed out that I wasn't becoming exactly like everybody wanted to be like in Austria. She said, no, we would not have selected you to come and people voted for you to come to Austria if you were going to come and become exactly like us. We wanted you to come with your unique insights and attributes from where you've been and where you've grown up and add that to what we have. And that really stuck with me is that you know, we all have very unique um, attributes, but it takes a lot of self-awareness to pick that out and be confident enough to contribute that because the world needs what each one of us uniquely has to add onto the world. The second thing I've really gotten to learn is that it's all about people. You cannot accomplish anything great alone or anything in particular alone. It's all about how to know, how to connect with other people, be personable, really understand what other people are thinking, what they call today emotional intelligence, right? You're trying to read other people, understanding where are they coming from? What can you contribute to them? And it's always that idea. What can you contribute to, to other people? In so doing, a small group of people can accomplish a lot of people. And I've had these experiences in multiple teams where you know, we're just a small group of people, but we were able to really perform as a team by really listening to each other and knowing what each other person was doing. Finally, the thing I've really understood is the world needs people who want to solve big problems. I've been very lucky in my different travels, whether it was you know, living in Tokyo, being in the US, to really interact with extremely, extremely wealthy people, people who lived across a bay to people like Bill Gates, all these luxury cars you could think about, private jets. But the thing is that I learned by engaging with them is that the most important thing was what value are you bringing to the world? If you can find something that you're solving for the world that is bringing a lot of value to them, then you know you won't have to really chase money, right? Um, I know today everybody is all about the hassle, getting rich. Instagram, you see all these people like telling you, you know, what you should do, don't sleep, don't do all these things, just work, work, work. But it should always be about what value are you adding to the world? How are you seeing what problem you're solving for people? And in that case, if you're solving that problem, you'll always have something that is able to drive you. One big example of that is what you see people like Elon Musk doing. It's all, all over the internet, the tweet that um, after he was declared the richest man in the world, he was like, oh, that's strange. And okay, back to work. Because he's really just focused on solving a really key problem that he feels humanity will be facing in the future. Electric cars, going to space, human civilization, getting out of the planet and solving the energy problem. Those are the three critical things that I've really learned. Yeah? So solving problems for the world is the most important thing. The value that you bring, really a lot of self-awareness, you know, learning what it is that you have unique and that you can contribute to the world. And the only way to do anything great is by working with that. Excellent, Otambi. That is a lot of uh, valuable lessons you've actually shared uh, through that second question. It's very interesting, like the more you have traveled and previously you courted a gentleman by saying that world is like a book. And the more you travel, the more you talk to people, the more you understand different cultures and contexts, the reason why people do things a certain way. I think we would learn so much more because everything has a reason behind it. Maybe a farmer in Amazon does a certain way of crop management. There might be a reason behind it. There might be reasons why the Aboriginal people in Australia did a certain way of farming. Yes. There's always reasons behind it. But I think in some ways, today's world is very shallow in, in how it looks at things. And I think the online world, you know, be it Instagram and all these quick Facebook kind of attributes we have developed over the last few decades is because yeah. I think we want to be satisfied fast. We really do not want to know what is underneath, but we just want to, you know, get the quick selfie with an important person, or we want to be seen to be living the big life. And I think yeah. that probably is not the best way for the world to move forward. And I think from what you're sharing, you know, yeah. you need to really bring value because definitely there is no shortage of problems in this world. But are you bold enough to take a step? Are you bold enough to take a stand and find a solution to that problem? And that journey might take you years or decades, but are you willing to persevere? And I think that is what would bring big changes in the world. So thank you for sharing that, Mutambe. It was really an encouragement. And moving on to our next question, can you please tell me when did you start Fast Tagger? 
And what was the inspiration behind this entrepreneurial venture? We see at Fast Tiger that our mission is to democratize the power of artificial intelligence. And particularly, we are really looking at emerging markets because we feel that emerging markets have really been left out of you know, the whole race for AI because so many people talk about AI as being the last invention of you know, humanity because of how powerful artificial intelligence will be in solving in the potential to solve so many problems. We've already seen how AlphaFold, part of DeepMind, has been able to solve a protein synthesis problem, which is a very complex one that will help, you know, in medicine for generations to come. We've already seen how AI models reduced the Google server's energy usage by over 30%. So they're all these things that AI is enabling. We've seen how even during the COVID pandemic, AI has speeded up like a lot of the uh, development of vaccines and also identification of cases. There's a lot of power of AI, but we feel like a lot of emerging markets have been left out. And so our real focus was like, how can we democratize this? One of our big focuses was like, how can we create data set that can be used in emerging markets to solve problems? For a case in, uh, example is we... At the beginning, we started about 2019. At the end of 2019, I was previously working for a large non-governmental organization called uh, the GIZ. And during that process, you know, saw a lot of work being done in the tech space across Africa. But then I also saw the huge gaps in terms of the technology. And then one of the things is like during a lot of the initial questions that we were asking about what we want to set up. We had an interview with university in Switzerland, Bayern University, and we found out that they were trying to build an AI model to detect skin cancer, but they just couldn't find labeled data sets from the African continent on darker skin tones. So that means they could not create a model that can actually identify skin cancer. And then we started digging deep and we started realizing that there's so many other areas in AI that cannot function because of this lack of data set. So the technique is machine learning, yeah? part of a technique in AI, which requires a lot of data for the machine to be able to make you know, good judgment in terms of probability and recognize things. And we just didn't have this labeled data sets on the continent. Then we also realized that it is an opportunity to create opportunities for young people to move into digital jobs for the future. We thought that this is actually a big problem in terms of not enough labeled data sets and not enough AI algorithms that are being developed for the emerging market, and particularly Africa. Africa is going to have the largest world population by 2100. Already by 2050, we'll have the world's largest youth population. So we just saw that Africa is actually going to be part of the future and a big part of it. And so we have to harness artificial intelligence to solve the problems that are there on the continent. Those are a lot of the, the thinking that started around why we set up AI. But I would take us even way back to my childhood, those days of working on that computer that my dad brought home. There was an interesting program that I found in one of those computers. It was called ELISA. It was one of the first ever chatbots developed in around the 1970s. And I would interact with it every day. Eventually, I wanted to figure out, okay, how it actually works and whether it was actually a real intelligence. I eventually realized that Eliza was actually not a real intelligence because it was just a set of programmed answers that if else, you know, so those were the beginnings of understanding what programming is. And I always felt that the way that machine and my interacting with it used to make me feel very normal and it was somehow like a psychologist. How do you feel? How can this kind of technology be used to also solve problems in, in society? And today you have programs like GPT-3, which is now doing a lot of amazing work out of OpenAI. We really wanted to see how we can bring that sort of technology to solve problems on the African continent and enable the continent to reach the sustainable development goals much faster than it, it is right now. Excellent, Mutambe. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's very encouraging to hear that by 2050, Africa would have the maximum youth population in the whole of the world, which is very interesting, isn't it? Because you have a group of people who are looking for opportunities, looking for positive engagements. People like you have a key role to play, you know, to make the path more or less ready for them. If AI and technology is the route that you're going to take and hopefully that they're going to jump into, probably there needs to be a lot more effort probably from individuals and governments to facilitate future opportunities for African uh, youth. It's very encouraging also that you are actually thinking, you know, as a business leader, as an entrepreneur, not only are you thinking about your present situation, but also thinking about the future, you know, how you can actually impact moving forward. So that is very positive um, Tembe, thank you so much for sharing that. Moving on to our next question. I believe you have touched on this. You did talk on data annotation 
or image annotation, you talked about various facets of AI. But in simple human terms, for a person, say for example, for an investor who is looking at Fast Tagger, how would you define your product and services in simple terms? So we like saying we are using the power of data to solve problems. That's the basic way that we put it. Yes, there's a lot of hype and buzz about artificial intelligence. People think it's Terminator that's coming, but it's really is using the power of data to solve problems. A lot of times, depending on you know which area we are looking at, um, right now we have a particular uh, focus on mapping data, geospatial data, and you know we we approach customers with the idea like, no, we can use this location and geospatial data to create solutions for you using data of location and the movement of people in these locations. And that means Earth observation data, such as satellite data, for you to help you make decisions in your business. One particular case is um, in the solar industry, where we had a client who originally had a big problem where they were having to download all the satellite imagery and manually count rooftops from that imagery to make decisions on where to put our solar mini grids. We are developing a solution from them like, where they can now get an algorithm through an API, which can now pick out these rooftops automatically from very recent satellite imagery. And then that can really help them make their decision. So this is how we are approaching a lot of clients. And so this is just one example of something, you know, computer vision. There are other conversations we've been having with people in, in speech to speech. We are creating new voices. We've been having conversations with other clients who are doing a lot more facial recognition and labeling that data. The essence is like, we want to see how, how do we use data to solve more more problems, right? And to create solutions and have analysis that will help our clients. Thank you, Mutambe, for bringing more insight onto that topic and giving us an example through what you shared, the rooftop kind of scenarios and trying to find out solutions for specific industries. And I think from what I can understand is, so you are probably developing products or services for specific businesses. You have the capacity to do it. So if they have a huge trove of data they've been collecting over a period of time, you would be able to create a product around that data to probably solve a problem that they have probably not had insights on. Am I, am I hearing you right? Yes. So we help them take that data and come up with solutions from that data, insights from that particular data. So in, in the particular case for the you know, solar company, they have all this satellite imagery and they want to know which rooftops and what kind of rooftops are here. So how many houses are there? If we set up a mini grid, how many people can we uh, service? How much income can we get from this? How big do we need to do the, the micro grid? And so now they can easily get these insights from all this image data in terms of satellite imagery that they have. We help them derive the insights and this informs their bottom line, which is providing solar energy to their clients. Excellent, Mutembe. So I think, you know, that insight for a very serious business is really worth a lot of money, I would think. So if you're a key player, say, for example, yeah. in Australia, and you're developing solar panels for rooftops of houses. Just an example, I could be wrong on this. And if you yeah. are able to have information or analyze satellite imagery and get a picture of how many rooftops have solar panels to start off with, yeah. that is a lot of insight onto what a business could strategize in terms of marketing campaigns and you know which areas to target. So that's a lot of wealth of insight that they could gain. Absolutely. You're, uh, you're completely right, Tony. That's exactly the, the direction that we're going. And this is particularly in solar. We see use cases in so many other areas where you could actually use machine learning to solve a lot of problems. Excellent. Thank you, Mutempe. And moving on to our next question, how is Fast Tagger different to other image annotation businesses out there? So I think one of the key differentiators that we've made up for ourselves is that we're not just doing labeling. So you have a lot of companies who only do labeling. We focus on the product in terms of the algorithm first, and then we work backwards. So a lot of people will only do labeling. And that's okay. It's, it's, a, it's a large market. It's, it's growing. It's um, expected to be a $4 billion market by 2024. But, you know, we don't just want to focus on the labeling side because, as I said, you know, our whole idea is democratizing artificial intelligence. So we, we want to look at the areas where there are really large gaps. We want to create those training data sets and then train the algorithms so that in terms of we say that we are building a company for the next 50 to 100 years, right? Because we see problems such as climate change coming. We see problems such as energy challenges coming and generally the problem of solving for poverty. And so what we are doing is not just labeling, but building the models that will 
continue training over the next 10 years and more years that will be so robust that they will be the best in class over the next 10 years to solve these problems, such as we're talking about problems in climate change, you know, really training a model to really understand the agricultural and yield prediction challenges on the African continent and how to give insurance or monitor what's happening on the smallholder farm so that they can be given insurance. That is what we are focusing on. That's how we are very different from a labeling company, which is a very okay place to be where you're just, you're getting the jobs, you're getting the images, you're getting the audio labels, you're doing sentiment analysis for an external client. Of course, we see that as part of what we initially will be doing, but we're saying we are building for the next 50 to 100 years yeah, in the continent, training those models so that they'll be so robust and that will democratize them by offering them as APIs to companies. Because companies right now spend maybe $400,000 for an AI team over a year to develop that an AI for you. But what we are saying is like, we'll have developed these models and people can be able to access them by API in the future. Excellent, Mutambe. Thank you for sharing that. And I believe you touched on those two words, democratizing AI, if I'm right. And I believe you shared this with me when we had our previous conversation. Can you elaborate a bit more on that, please? Okay. So right now, as we see, you know, globally, it seems to be like an AI arms race that is going on, right? Whether you're pitting China or the US or other very developed nations, right, who have the resources, you know, it can take you millions of dollars just to build one very powerful AI model. So deep at DeepMind, they were acquired by, by Google and Google is spending tons of money for that. But what might end up happening, and a lot of, you know, scholars and a lot of people in the AI space are asking these questions of the governance of AI. Will it just be one very powerful person who has the most powerful AI that nobody else, and they decide the access to it or they decide what can be done with very powerful AI. And so we see a world where already there's a lot of inequalities. You look at, I mean, growing up in Africa, growing up where I was, I saw these inequalities, but I'm trying, I cannot imagine how much more equality will be there with AI. Like that's a potential. Yuval Harari of the uh, Sapiens fame, the amazing author from Israel, he recently talked at the World Economic Forum and he said that, you know, AI risks creating a world where there will be you know, data colonies and the elites of the world, right? Because the people in the data colonies weren't able to build up the capacity to, to harness AI. And then others are just benefiting from AI. Imagine if you had the amazing AI you know, just for the financial markets and then it's only belonging to you know, one particular farm or one particular country in the control of the markets. Out of that possible future that we want the world to avoid, people like Elon Musk talk about a lot of these like responsible AI. It's like how can we build capacity for AI to solve challenges, especially big challenges such as climate change and others on the African continent and other emerging markets, and then democratize that by giving access to it by API so that not every company will be able to afford the $400,000 a year team. That's just for the people. Right? This is just what machine learning, AI researchers and others, that's the team will command. But then they have to now label their own data. Then they have to train their own models. So we are a company where actually our ambitions go way beyond just labeling the data. We, we also want to work on the cutting edge of you know, speeding up the training of models using other technologies and then now offer those APIs to companies and to businesses and to organizations and to governments for them to benefit from AI. Because as the world is going right now, people are going to use it as an ambulance. Governments are going to nationalize sort of AI. And we want to avoid that future that Yuval Harari has warned us about. Um, it's a very big goal, but you know that's, I believe like everything is hard. So you might as well just pick a very big, hard problem to, to work on. Thank you, Mutambi, for sharing that. And it's very encouraging to hear that apart from this business that you're running, you also have a hard way. You want to make that access to AI equal for everyone in a way. Especially, I think your goal is to make it more accessible for people, businesses and governments in Africa so that they can actually benefit from the use of AI in their governments and be it anything, pharmaceuticals or farming or climate change and whatever. So that's a very ambitious and good goal to have. I wish you the very best with that, Mutembe. And moving on to our next question. So moving forward, what are your plans for Fastagger? I think the biggest plan is really focusing this year on really, really defining 
the key products that we are building. I mentioned before the solar side of things of what we're working on. We are looking at products that we can build in the finance and financial inclusion space because that's a very big space on the continent. We have a lot of challenges. One of the interesting things if you look at the African continent is most people are able to do what they do on the continent through remittances. That's why we have you know phenomenons such as MPESA phenomenon of mobile money. And then every year, year on year, there's a lot of remittances coming in from abroad. And this is actually what runs most households, Kenyans who are abroad sending money. So we're looking to create solutions on, on that. And we are looking to create more, using more space technology. When I was talking to you about the geospatial and the uh, satellite imagery, we've seen a huge opportunity in that particular area. As Africa has remained quite behind in using sp space technology, so using you know, Earth observation data to do all these things like ensuring smallholders have proper insurance by always seeing like what they've done on the farm or other space technologies such as internet communication or other space technologies such as so right now we have a lot of illegal fishing going on in the Indian Ocean waters or in other Atlantic waters in Africa and it's very hard we have very small navies right but you can use computer vision and satellite imagery to actually detect vessels which are not supposed to be there and you can combat that and you know, Africa can really take advantage of what they call the blue economy so we are really looking at this really defining products in this particular verticals and really pushing them out. And one of our big focuses this year is, of course, going to be raising funds so that we can be able to build these models and solve these problems, and as well as building our teams. Because as I said before, you can't do anything without. And so really bring this new generation of young people on the continent who are extremely smart and very fast at learning and getting them to join this sort of new wave of building, you know, sort of STEAM professionals. I think today you have to be like someone who's interested in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. You have to put them all together and creating more of these careers on the continent. Thank you, Mutambe, for sharing that. And uh, moving on to our next question, what has been the effect of the current COVID-19 pandemic on your business? I think the, the biggest challenge was uh, pretty much the isolation. I think I, as a person, I find that, um, you know, I have some qualities of an introvert, but I also have a lot of qualities of an extrovert in that I like engaging with people. I like feeling the energy from people and getting ideas from people that way. And so I think even as a startup, because startups are all about the energy you're, you're working on with people or engaging with ideas and such. And so I think that has been the biggest challenge, although I think a big benefit has come from previously to attend like global you know, machine learning and other conferences, you'd have to travel. And you know, usually you're from the global south. These are problems come in when you can't attend these like top-notch conferences. But now we could all access them on Zoom and we didn't have to travel and, and get visas. So it's been an interesting situation where it's actually good on, to some extent that you know, it has, again, opened up a lot of opportunities. We actually did our first revenue during COVID. Actually, before COVID, we were, we were struggling. After, we actually got our first revenue and we were able to have completely remote teams. It validated more our hypothesis of really having, creating jobs in the digital space, really solving problems with software. We now really got into a geospatial earth observation and remote sensing data and AI. That created a lot of opportunities for us because you don't have to be anywhere. You know, you download satellite imagery, you build algorithms, it reads, you send everything via cloud. So I think more organized organizations learning about uh, shifting, doing their digital transformation. There's been a joke that in the last year, who was most responsible for digital transformation in your company? Was it the CEO, the CTO, or was it C, COVID? And most, the reality is COVID has been done that has really accelerated. We see this happening with conversational board, different organizations. We actually see a lot more opportunity that has been generated because of COVID. We need more healthcare on the continent and around the world. And so, you know, machine learning and AI will, has contributed to that. Although there have been challenges where maybe investors have become a bit more shy of making investments, I believe now when they look at businesses that have actually succeeded, uh, despite COVID, you know, they'll be more interested in them. We are remaining very optimistic. I think one of the things that I've lunch is really important is like being a pragmatic optimist, not just a blind optimist, but a pragmatic optimist. I see complaining as actually a good thing, but it's only bad when you don't do anything about it because I feel the only thing that moves humanity forward is being able to complain looking for problems and then solving that. That's what really helps. So pragmatic optimism is how we're going forward with dealing with COVID. Excellent, Mutembe. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's very encouraging and positive to know that despite these challenges, I think with the online world, as you said, you know, with Zoom and everything of that sort, I think before COVID, people used to spend 
in practical terms, a lot of time traveling to their workplaces when now they can actually sit in the comforts of their home. I'm sure a lot of people have put on a bit of extra weight, but the time that's spent Zoom on... workouts though. <laughs> the time that's spent on traveling, people are able to spend quality time more or less at home, be focused on job and hopefully find solution to problems and then communicate through online mediums and solve problems. So it's very encouraging to know that despite these challenges that COVID has brought on, you actually strengthen probably your team and yeah. you're better focused in actually coming out of COVID in terms of your vision for the future with your business. So that's very positive and encouraging. And thank you so much for sharing that. Mutembe, moving on to our next question. Could you please share the name of one book that has been an inspiration or a motivator in your entrepreneurial journey and why? Top of my list is a book called Disciplined Entrepreneurship by a professor out of MIT called Bill Ouellette. Um, I'm one of those people who, you know, you know, being in a very nice, secure job, everything was going pretty well, but I just had the hunger to solve more problems. They, someone said that entrepreneurship is a virus and once you get it, you can't really beat it. So I quit my job. That was February of 2019. One of the first things I did was to, to sign up for a program called MIT Bootcamp on um, innovation and entrepreneurship, particularly to set up AI, robotic, and IoT companies. And so it happened in, in Tokyo. And the whole way it's built around is the 24 steps for of disciplined entrepreneurship, usually taught at MIT, but in a very condensed version. The concept of disciplined entrepreneurship. So it says like to be a disciplined entrepreneurship, you have to be both a pirate and a Navy SEAL, right? So you have the mind of a pirate where you're always out there, you're always disrupting things, but you have the execution of a Navy SEAL, very precise, very checking everything, setting up your mission, SEAL Team 6, having the mind and energy and disruption of a pirate, but the execution of a Navy SEAL. I learned a lot from that particular book and that particular course, because a lot of times people say that oh, entrepreneurs are just these crazy risk takers who, you know, just do crazy things. But no, 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 no. Uh, actually, entrepreneurs, I would say, are some of the most calculating of risk people that exist. If you're a successful entrepreneur, then you're really good at calculating risk and jumping in, but being calculating, saying high risk, high reward, but then you're checking everything to make sure that you don't just completely run aground. In this case, if it's like uh, even the, the pirate ship running aground versus like the Navy SEALs, like really knowing what they're doing. So I'd say that has been the most influential book for me, Disciplined Entrepreneurship by Bill Ouellette. Thank you. Mutembi for sharing that. And I believe the book you've been talking about was this one, I believe. Yes, you have it. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting book in the sense that, you know, some people say entrepreneurship, you have to be born with it. Some people say it's something that you learn from people over a period of time. But I think one good thing that Bill has done is actually give a framework in how it can actually be done. And I think that is very encouraging because now you don't really necessarily need to be born into an entrepreneurial family. You don't need entrepreneurship to appear in your dream or a vision. You actually can practice entrepreneurship, identify the pain points and hopefully work towards solving a problem. I'm still yes. in the process of learning. Sometimes you have to go through it a number of times to really yes. get on top of it. But thank you so much, Tembe, for sharing that. And moving on to our next question, what are the life and business lessons you would like to share with someone who is planning to start a business in Kenya? I think another concept that I've recently learned also through, you know, following up with uh, Bill Olet, the whole idea of like fearless spirit of a pirate and execution skills of SEAL Team 6 is something called anti-fragile. It's been popularized by the author Nassim, who wrote the book Black Swan as well. So he has another concept in He's talking about being anti-fragile. I think in life and in, in business, this is one thing that I've learned is the most important. About a year ago, before the pandemic, I started training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And as being the lowest white belt there, you're just getting demolished every day, every single day, every single day on the mat. But then the idea is like, you're never going to get better if you quit. You have to keep on getting on the mat. After doing a role with someone, you've been higher belt, you've been completely demolished, getting back in there. And slowly, slowly you learn, you start learning. And so I take this concept of anti-fragile, disciplined entrepreneurship and a bit of realism and jiu-jitsu and like what I've been learning in that process and put them together and say, you know, that's what has really taught me. I've learned a lot in the last one and a half years, almost two years of doing entrepreneurship in that. The most important thing is this concept of anti-fragile, taking the hits the world has, taking risks, going out there, having that fearless spirit of a pilot, knowing that you could end up sinking 
you know, your ship could sink. But then knowing that if you rely on certain skills that you build, you can be able to get through anything. Maybe your first ship will sink, but okay, fine. You've learned, okay, not to go near that shore again. Okay, you navigate a bit past it. Now, now you start teaching yourself cartography and you start teaching yourself, you know, how to be a good ship person, getting the right crew on your, tea, on your ship. You, know, you start thinking about those things, you know, how to train them, how to go through the boot camps that the Navy SEALs go through and get those high level skills so that you can be able to now execute properly as SEAL Team 6 on a mission to solve something. So that idea of anti-fragile, being able to continuously put yourself in adversity, learn, get the skills and then grow in that experience. Don't Let's not hide from adversity and challenges. Let's jump into it. It's hard, but that's the only way you learn. I used to watch Khan Academy a lot. And uh, in Khan Academy, they say like, actually, when you're struggling, that's when you know that your brain is making those connections. So the next time you look at that problem again, there are some connections that have been made and they're just going to be made stronger and stronger. The concept of anti-fragile by uh, Nassim, I would say anybody who's thinking about doing entrepreneurship anywhere in the world, I'd say also particularly in Kenya. Kenya is an interesting market. It's highly competitive, highly diversified, an intense market, but it's also a very exciting market. We've got a lot of fearless pirates here and you can build yourself as an anti-fragile person you can build the skills, execution skills of an EVCO and you can be able to succeed. Excellent, Mutembe. Thank you so much for sharing all these wonderful points. And I think looking back into your journey with Fastagger, I mean, you have a long way to go. What stands out for me is that you've always been learning. You've been always constantly understanding different perspectives. So I would say that, you know, you're really cognitively diverse in your thinking. And you had this unique opportunity to work out of different geographies. You had that opportunity to learn how people speak, what do they eat, how do they look at problems. And that is a wealth of knowledge and information you brought back when you came back to Kenya. And so I would think that, you know, you would be able to sit in a meeting with people from all across the world and you would really be able to find a common point of discussion or find a common point of interest because, you know, that gives you that opportunity to appreciate I think, you know, that global experience you had, that opportunity to experience the wider world and the wider community. And I think those three points that you initially mentioned, you need to be confident in your own skin. You need to be proud of who you are. You don't have to be sorry for who you are. You need to be confident about who you are, your history, your heritage, your parents, your nation, your land. At the end of the day, we are all human beings and we have our value the moment we are born in this world. So I think being confident in our own skin is very important. Sometimes I think the world turns to paint a picture of exclusivity instead of inclusivity. And it could be yes. because of the world history where you had dominant past trying to impose their mandate on the rest of the world and i think that kind of took away the diversity that was there but i think that space is slowly being populated by people migrating to different countries and different communities coming together and i think an appreciation of sorts that you need diversity in every space yes. which brings unique perspectives to the table and unique skills to solve problems. So that is a positive thing. And I think you touched on emotional intelligence, the ability to understand and appreciate different people and their attitudes and their understandings of pain points. Because if you put five people across the table and you give them a problem, the way they look at that problem will be very different, more or less, I would think. All those perspectives are important. That is a wealth of knowledge. So if you are going into probably the Middle Eastern market, and if you have a person from the Middle East who sees a problem in a certain way, that is insight for you. If you're going into the European market and a person from Europe shares an insight, that is yeah. an opportunity for you. So instead of nullifying or saying that that's not important, having a broad perspective and the mind to accommodate different perspectives, I think is very important in today's world as we try to solve global problems. And I think your desire to democratize AI, making it accessible to the populations of the world, because I think as technology has improved and developed, we tend to think that, you know, everyone is enjoying the fruits of advancement and technology and medicine and all these kind of things. But I think it is not the case. The other day, the World Health Organization head was saying with the COVID vaccine rollout happening, it seems to be the case that wealthy nations are stocking up. So what is going to happen to people in poorer countries? This virus is not a fault of their own, but they are still going to bear 
the brunt of it. So I think humanity needs to look at the world as their own. You know, they need to acknowledge that human beings are same and reach out, I think, to work for a more equitable world, if I can say that. So it is very encouraging, Mutembe, that you're actually working towards that. I also love the fact that, you know, you talked about your experience with Jitsu, where you said you were beaten many times, but you've always made a point to get back on the mat. And that's so very important, isn't it? Because you could be beaten a hundred times, hopefully not more than that. But, you know, you need to get back every time and be ready for the fight. And that is how you learn, because as entrepreneurs, I think we should not be afraid to fail. It's easy to say it. The cost of failure can be pretty hard. Sometimes it can be loss of money. Sometimes it can be even the loss of your home, relationships. But I think being honest about it with the stakeholders, in some cases, it could be a family. Some cases, it could be investors. But being open and honest about the challenges, I think, would help in building and sustaining good relationships moving forward. So, Mutembi, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It was an honor and a pleasure talking to you. I wish you the very best with Fast Tagger. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I really appreciate, you know, the way you're really good at asking questions, really getting essence from interviewees. Um, I really appreciate uh, the engagement that we've had today, and uh, I really look forward to engaging with you more in the future. One thing I keep on reminding myself, I have a quote that I've made for myself. I've been able to see one of the most beautiful sunsets in the world on the top of Mount Fuji and experienced the, an amazing you know, sea breeze at Ipanema Beach in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And one thing that I've learned about all this is that all humans want to do is connect with each other. And I think that is the only way we can make the world a better place and advance humanity. And so thank you for this opportunity that you've created for connection. You're most welcome, Mutembe, and all the best. Thank you.